Okay, so welcome everyone. One more lecture of epistaxis. What is epistaxis? It's simply medical term for nosebleed. Okay, so any nose nosebleed is called as epistaxis. And uh, it's a very, very, very common thing in old age group. Okay, there are many causes. The most common cause is trauma. Nose picking is very important cause. Temperature changes are very important cause. And as you know, like in my previous lecture, what I talk about is Kizzle back plexus or little area, which is a highly, highly, highly vascular area. Okay. And um, right, this is the Kizzle back plexus or the little area. 90% of the nose bleeds, you know, that comes from this area. Um, so you can see over here that, you know, there is anterior, posterior, ethmoidal arteries. Um, they are coming from the internal carotid artery. Internal carotid artery, by the way, it gives a branch called azophthalmic artery, which give anterior and posterior ethmoidal artery. Then you can see sphenopalatine artery, this one, which is coming. So it is a branch of internal maxillary artery, which comes from external carotid artery. And see internal carotid artery and external carotid artery, they are very important and big vessels. Okay. Uh, where, whereas you can see over here, um, this one, for example, superior labial artery. This one is a branch of facial artery, which is again coming from external carotid artery. Now you can see this one, greater palatine artery. This is a branch of descending palatine artery, which is a branch of internal maxillary artery, artery which ultimately coming from external carotid artery. So in short, both these are coming from internal carotid artery. This one, this one, this one, all coming from external carotid artery. So uh, this area is highly vascular area. Okay, so or this area is called as Little's area or uh, Kizzelbach's plexus as well. Now, why epistaxis is important? Because it is too common. There are many causes, local causes are there. For example, trauma, which is the most common cause. Trauma, I will add over here, it is the most common cause. Okay, most common cause is trauma. And uh, if, if, you, if, you, if you know, uh, uh, nasal picking, you know, nose picking. So sometimes when you're picking nose, you know, it can bleed. So uh, it is the most common cause, fractures can occur. Uh, foreign bodies can be there um, then you can say iatrogenic or the things which are self like by some procedures like nasal surgery sinus surgery uh, they can cause uh, nasal dryness is a very important cause you know like especially in winters when you have a heating system inside your home so it's very common especially kids you know they started nosebleeds out of nowhere so that is because of you know nasal dryness dry air is there and it causes that area to be dried septal perforation can be there um, the people who use drugs like cocaine you know they have uh, sometimes there's like the septal cartilage get um, perforated uh, nasal spray is the people who use nasal spray so there are many local causes tumors can be there um, and uh, this is the same external corroded enter like the thing which I was telling you, internal carotid as well as external carotid systems, you know, they are meeting over here. So trauma, this is the explanation of that. Local causes, inflammatory causes like rhinitis. We just now we discussed in the previous lecture, viral rhinitis, allergic rhinitis, bacterial rhinitis, fungal rhinitis. Um, tumors can be there. Uh, like um, benign tumors like polyps can be there angiofibroma is very 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 important uh, not like to know each and everything about that like uh, when we will study polyps I will discuss about that and it could be malignant like squamous cell carcinoma or any any other one uh, sometimes of course we don't know any causes like uh, we call them etiopathic okay without any cause um, then there can be many systemic causes for example Mm, coagulopathies can be there 
uh, what are the coagulopathies mm. uh, wait um, coagulopathies like many people um, they have some diseases like hemophilia okay hemophilia you know these are the people in which what you can say uh, like they are, they have deficiency in the clotting factor so whenever they start bleeding their bleeding time is too much prolonged it's very hard to stop that hemophilia is one willy brand disease is there okay um, then for example you some some people who are using some medications um, very important cause guys um, medications like uh, uh, you can say like the anticoagulant medications even in sales can cause you know anyone who is taking anticoagulants when you're taking anticoagulants of course you are at the risk of bleed that makes sense and NSAIDs for example so NSAIDs and this one some hematological problems um, all the clotting factors are formed in liver so liver failure all the proteins are retained in the body by the help of kidneys if the kidneys are failed so we will lose protein so kidney problem can be there um, then there can be conditions like you know uh, hypertension guys people think hypertension is a very important cause though it's not okay so hypertension can be there as well hypertension it's a systemic cause of course um, you can see over here hereditary hemorrhagic telangiectasia. It is also called as Osler uh, Weber Rendu syndrome. Uh, these things can cause as well. Poisons can cause nutritional lack and these things. Many things can cause. So, in simple words, uh, see whenever you are going to talk about like taking the history of epistaxis, uh, most of the time it is trauma. Uh, but like sometimes, you know, when you don't know the cause, especially in elderly people. Um, it's hard to find the cause so we have to take a complete history okay um, um, so at this thing like angiofibroma is a tumor which is very common in young people uh, young males especially adolescents so it looks like a polyp but you know whenever you touch it it start bleeding it's angiofibroma this tumor is made up of vessels so we they, they do a CG scan just to see what's the extent and what they do is like they they, they go for surgery of course so 90% of bleeds as I told you it is from the little area okay now epistaxis can be classified to two things anterior epistaxis when the blood is coming out from the nose and posterior epistaxis when the blood is dripping in your throat many people you know they like the blood goes into the tummy and due to oxidation the blood changes color it becomes brownish or blackish color and it's an irritant so they vomit and then when they vomit so it's like the vomit is basically a coffee colored of vomit so now anterior epistaxis is more common posterior epistaxis is less common anterior epistaxis occurs from the little area posterior epistaxis come uh, occur mostly from the posterior superior part of the nasal cavity often it's difficult to localize because this one is anterior this one is posterior this one anterior one in young people posterior one in old people anterior one the cause is mostly trauma posterior one old people think about atrosclerosis hypertension anterior one easy to control posterior one difficult to control need hospitalization okay so uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this guys because if you know the causes you can take history ask when it started how much is it first time how often okay and any history of trauma any nose picking whether see the weather any conditions they have any liver problem any kidney problems depending on the age okay uh, any drugs they are taking any blood disorders they have they are running in the family and then of course we go for the physical examination we examine their nose we examine uh, we do a rhinoscopy interior posterior nowadays you know fibro optic endoscopies are available uh, it's a small you can say a small tube which can you can pass inside the nose and it have a camera and it can, you can see inside that you can see in the nasopharynx simply 
so physical examination we can do in these patients okay lab studies though see as the causes are too much so you can practically do anything you can do cbc you can do clotting profile you can do ct scan to rule out angiofibroma so you can do a lot of investigation you can do renal function testing you can check their blood for any clotting factors deficiency you can check their lipid levels if you are thinking about atherosclerosis you can think about infections okay you can think about tumors you can take biopsies of course like the investigations if i will talk about there are many okay uh, but the important thing about fsx is the treatment so guy so i am going to talk more about treatment in this condition like in this case um see um we cannot discuss like case by case okay you know whenever anyone have nose bleed in the home what we do we ask them to sit lean a little far forward um don't swallow the blood um and we ask them to pinch their nose for at least like 5 to 20 minutes right of course we pinch the cartilaginous part not the bony part and most of the time you know the bleeding from anterior or anterior apex as it block it is it, it stops by this way just by pinch, pinching the nose for a while okay but okay what we are going to discuss is like most of the bleedings you know anterior apex is controlled by this thing some of the time you know we can do a packing anterior packing you can see we pack the nose we put a lot of you can say uh this uh, um, bandages inside by the way uh, there are what you can say some special preparations are also available in the hospital to pack the nose but uh, in many of the countries you know they they make by the help of bandages so what is the science behind behind this thing when you will pack the nose of course you are exerting pressure on the area and whenever there is any bleeding any anywhere in this in in, in the body any part of the body the first thing is to exert the pressure for some time of course like uh, it helps in stopping the bleeding in in anterior apex as you can see the area clearly and if it cannot be stopped by pinching the nose of course you will can do cautery uh, if if you don't know about cautery of course you can see a youtube video how they do cautery you know they can do cautery on the skin it's like it gives a small burn to that area which basically block the bleeding site that's it so let's discuss about uh, uh, a patient who comes with bleeding and any patient or old one or young one of course the first thing is abc's check their airways bleed breathing and circulation of course like there could be some patient who is bleeding so much that you know maybe you will found that he's in hypotension and he is in shock of course like hemorrhagic shock so of course in that case you are going to give him iv fluids okay uh, normal saline you will cross match his blood you will arrange blood you will give him blood of course that makes sense but the first thing you know we we check the abc's we make sure the airway is open breathing circulation we check take the vitals blood pressure pulse temperature oxygen saturation we apply 20 minutes of constant pressure if see if just to see if the bleeding is stopping or not we try to determine the location of the bleeding either it's anterior either it's posterior okay try to examine the nose by the help of speculum uh, one of the way you know which is which is which can be used quickly is by using a cotton cotton and soak it in um, lidocaine you know Uh, one of the thing you know in medical care what we can do is i am writing over here okay so we we put a cotton swab uh, in lidocaine lidocaine is a drug you know which uh, which is used for anesthesia but lidocaine is a drug which causes vasoconstriction so when we apply that you know it 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 either decrease the bleeding or completely stop the bleeding but of course like just an anterior septum because posteriorly you know it's very hard to apply that 
uh, we <coughs> of course take the blood sample send it to the lab to do all the investigations to check the clotting profile liver function test and ctbt prothrombin time aptt and all these levels we can check so first line is always you know applying this vasoconstrictors and if for example the first line fails so this is the first line if the first line fails then we go for so this is the first line if the bleeding is not stopped by pressure okay then we go to the second line I'm sorry this one so cautery is the second line okay so mostly you know the cautery they do cauterize by silver nitrate never cauterize both sides of the septum because if you are cautering the right and the left nasal sides you know you can basically destroy the cartilage you can create a hole inside the nose okay okay so if the second line fails as well then what we can do is um, so first line is applying lidocaine second line is of course like cautery if it cannot be controlled then if there is an interior hemorrhage so what we do what we do to them I think I should change the color as well. Okay. We pack the nose. Uh, what they do, like they take this, you can say, the gauze which is available okay they make it a long strip see what they do okay this is the further pursuit so they make a long strip they soak it in vaseline okay and they put it in layers like this this is horizontal layer this is vertical layering okay so simply what you can say Nowadays, there are some sophisticated things available in the market as well. For example, gel foam wrapped in something. Okay, so we, we pack the nose and we leave it for two to three days. So nowadays, by the way, there is the nasal tampons are available as well. Nasal tampons. Okay. Uh, they are like of different shape. You can Google the things, you can see. And... Uh, there is like new things also available like some some preparations which are basically hemostatic they stop the bleeding one name i told, can tell you is flow seal uh, it's 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 a company name not a generic name okay it's a brand name so it is basically a hemostatic type of thing which basically uh, stop the bleeding okay so we can do this thing and if it's a posterior hemorrhage, if it's a posterior hemorrhage, oh, by the way, you know, this spelling is weird. I'm going to change them. So it's a posterior hemorrhage. What can be done in these patients? So if it's a posterior hemorrhage, what we can do is um, depending on like either you can visualize or you cannot visualize. For example, if you can visualize, of course, you will apply cautery. Okay. But if you cannot visualize, then of course, you will put a posterior pack, posterior pack. What they do is, see, they put, they take a Foley's catheter, they put it in the nose, take it out from the mouth, they make a big gauze pack like this, and then they pull it from here. 
this gauze bag will go and will be stuck here. Once it's stuck here, you know, they are going to attach the other part of the string which will one, one more gauze bag. So again, like they are blocking both sides. Okay. One of the ways like there is the presence of this balloon as well. What they do, you can see, you know, they put like this and you know, then they fill, it, fill up the balloon. Balloon A and Balloon B. Balloon A with 10 ml of fluid and Balloon B with 30 ml of fluid. So it is like to create a pressure. So posterior pack can be used. Okay, using a Foley's catheter gauze pack as I show you. Uh, balloon packing can be done. Balloon packing can be done. As I show you in that slide. And uh, admit them in hospital. They need hospital admit them in hospital. Uh, of course, like monitor them, observe them, because you know posterior bladings can go into their airways, can obstruct that. They can get secondary bacterial infections. Okay, so they have like they can go a lot of things. Guys, if for example these things, uh, what you can say, are not working for example okay if these things this treatment which i already talk about these things are not working then we go for the next level so what is the next level is surgical ligation we ligate that arteries we block those arteries okay by embolization you can say okay so, or we go for a submucous resection operation. So this is like what is done ultimately. Of course, like call a hematologist and international radiologist to, to do that. So how we can prevent that? Of course, like tell the people, you know, don't let your nose to get dry, use humidifier, saline spray, avoid irritants if there is any hypertension treat that any coagulopathies treat that so all those things can be managed by this way so that's about uh, epistaxis okay nasal fractures uh, we are not going to cover this thing nasal fractures mostly guys they go for ct scans and um, of course, like this is very important. Okay, you know DNS is a condition in which like the septum is deviated, you know, on one side. So when the when the septum is deviated on one side, what is going to happen? That see, there will be hypertrophic of the other other side of the mucosa. Many people they have this thing. So some people, you know, they have like the deviation because of the history of nasal trauma. Someone have like from childhood. Okay, so now see there are different type of what you can say deviation of the nasal septum like this is S shape, then there is anterior dislocation, there is C shape deflection, there can be S shape deflection, there can be a spur or there can be a thickening of the nasal septum. These are the turbinates, okay, they are showing, they are trying to show you over here. So, of course, like when, of course, uh, someone have uh, things like this, so what happens is they have continuous symptoms. And when they have continuous symptoms, like, you know, because of nasal blockage, the symptoms are more like, you know, hypertrophy of one side of the mucosa, as well as the turbinates, they have nasal obstruction. And then all the same story which will run, like headache, runny nose, runny eyes, sneezing, all these things and when you will examine of course you can see the deviated septum yourself so the same you know allergic rhinitis story which is like I talked in my previous lecture so clinical like same of course it can lead to a sexist as well so we can do a CT scan to see like see the CT scan is showing how bad is the condition and the treatment is simply septoplasty or SMR submucous resection Okay, I, I never talk uh, like to talk about like uh, how how they do the surgeries because it's better to see the surgeries yourself, the animations as well as uh, the things. 
So I will talk about the indications. See, indications of this surgery is what like deviated septum as a part of other procedures like for cosmetic reasons, anyone who have recent like recurrent epistaxis, sinusitis due to septal deviation, oh, and anyone who have like symptoms like headache and other things are not so important. Of course, contraindication, anyone who have like active infection, you cannot do untreated diabetes, hypertension, like more or less like the general contraindication for any surgery. So how they do this thing, they have to make straight this septum and this is cartilage. So see what they are doing, they are making small cuts, they are taking out small part of cartilage and then they are going to straight it. Sometimes they resect, sometimes they bring it back and fix it with the suture. Okay, so the last thing is foreign bodies, guys, uh, foreign bodies are very common in children, okay. There is something called as rhinolith, rhinolith is what stone in the nose, okay. Um, you know, there is something called as nasal myiasis, nasal myiasis. Nasal my my yeses. Now, what is this thing? By the way, this is like you know maggots in nose, flies, maggots in nose. Okay, this topic is not so important to tell you the truth, but some of the points which I will tell you, which are important to remember, is they are very common in children, guys. Children can put practically anything, organic stuff, non-organic stuff, uh, like you know chalk, small balls, seeds, candies, any piece of clothes, tissue paper, anything, okay, beads, pebbles, paper, you can read over here, uh, most of the time, you know, it is the kids who do this thing, so whenever like the children, you know, uh, they, they present with this thing, uh, what we do is like we take history and we found like if they have evidence that the child have put something in the nose or not if they if they have evidence of course like and you will if any will examine you have seen so that's thing but if for example if the foreign body is inside for a long period of time maybe they can present with some secondary bacterial infection like a foul smelling discharge from the nose green color okay um, we can do some imaging as well if needed but most of the time not done because it can be easily seen by rhinoscopy. So how, how to treat that, you know, few of the things that can be very easily removed and I have done that thing many times myself even by the help of a forcep. But the most important thing, if the, if the child is cooperative with you or not, okay. So if the child is cooperative, so of course, like by the help of forcep, you can take out things like cotton and small toys like this okay uh, some of the things you know you, you can you can put uh, what you can say a uh, hooked forcep uh, to grab anything like a ball and you know drag it with the floor of the nose and bring it outside okay uh, this can be done be careful like because if, the, if that thing is going to go into their like back side of the nose you know it can go into the, their airways can block their airways so this is like one of the complications and that's the reason we don't try this thing with any patient in any patient who is not cooperative rather what we do is like we admit them we give them general anesthesia and then we remove that okay of course we don't try with the, we don't remove any foreign body if the child is not cooperative because you can you can uh, maybe like cause some damage inside the nose and they will start bleeding for example the the thing can go into their air, airways okay so that, that thing is done under anesthesia. So that's all. Like It can be removed by balloon catheters. Of course, you will put a catheter behind that object, then inflate the balloon, and the balloon will make that space like a thing to drag that, that thing out. Suction catheters are also there. Glue can be used if you can uh, directly see the objects. And of course, you can remove it by the glue. Uh, nowadays, you know, nasal endoscopes are available. So, you know, it's very easy to locate the foreign body as well as carefully remove it. So that's a good part. Uh, most of these type of removal is done by rose position, in rose position. So that that position is called as rose position. 
okay and uh, you can see like what's the rose position like again on google but uh, uh, uncooperative child of course anesthesia sometimes sometimes endotracheal intubation is done uh, if, if there's higher chances that the object can go into their airway so of course we, we do endotracheal intubation just to make sure like during the surgery they are getting the ventilation so that's all about uh, this thing and uh, hope you understand and like the lecture so until next lecture of ENT bye bye everyone